The Institute of World Affairs at the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee presents International Focus, a weekly discussion of the people and events behind today's global headlines. Support provided by Milwaukee Public Television and the UWM Center for International Education. Now here's your host, Doug Savage. Welcome to International Focus. The bloody civil war that convulsed Sierra Leone between 1991 and 2002 left more than 50,000 people dead. Millions more were displaced. Many sought refuge in neighboring Guinea. Amidst the turmoil and tragedy of these refugee camps, a small group of musicians found some beat up instruments and equipment donated by a relief agency and used them to create what would become one of Africa's top recording and touring bands. Sierra Leone's refugee all-stars have gone on to play in some of the world's most prestigious venues. Their story was chronicled in an award-winning 2005 documentary entitled simply, Sierra Leone's Refugee All-Stars. Over a decade after the end of the Civil War, Sierra Leone is again in crisis with the outbreak of Ebola. On tour in the U.S. when the crisis hit, the All-Stars have opted to stay on the road to raise awareness about the plight of people in the Ebola-impacted parts of West Africa. We're pleased to be joined in the studio today by the founder and leader of the band, Ruben Koroma. Also joining us are band members, vocalist and lead guitar player Ashade Pierce, and bassist and vocalist Dennis Sano. Sierra Leone Refugee All-Stars, welcome to International Focus and to Milwaukee. Yeah, thank you. Very thank much. you for having thank us. You. Well, I'm wondering if we could just start with uh, with the story of uh, how you got together. I know you uh, you were all professional musicians before you got together as a band, but tell us a little bit how you came together. Well, it was um, you know we were playing together actually in Sierra Leone when the war broke out, and uh, I I escaped. You know, and the war separated us. I went to the to the refugee camp, and you know, a very bad situation in the refugee camp. You know, but as a musician, I just think that where I have to continue playing my music. So I was looking out for musicians, and I was so lucky I found them and formed this <laughs> this band in the refugee situation. So talk a little bit about that situation and when did you make the decision that you had to go as, as the, the war began? Well, that was when there was uh, a battle between the rebel and the government forces. That was not easy. Uh, we were staying at the airport and there was a battle. The rebel the rebels were controlling the airport and the government forces were trying to take this airport out of the control of the rebels. So that was what uh, we witnessed. I was arrested personally. I was arrested because I was staying by the airport area, you know, and I was arrested by these ECOMOC forces and I was really tortured, seriously. And, uh, you know, about to be killed, in fact. But, uh, you know, because I was a very popular musician, you know, some, some of the military officers say, oh, no, this man is a musician. We know him very well. So, you know, they free me. And since then, my wife was not comfortable. She told me, saying, no, we have to leave. So we had to walk for about 30 miles on foot. And we arrived to a place where we just crossed and then walk over to, to the Republic of Guinea. Yeah. And the Shari, is your story similar? And when, when did you leave? Well, I did not leave. I was unfortunate to get out of the country. The time I noticed to, 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 to leave the country, it was too late for me because they have taken over all the areas. So there was no escaping route for me. So I have to be there till the, war, the end of the war. And what were those years like? I mean, how, how, oh how? my goodness, it was horrible. Because I saw the kill 
they kill people in front of my eyes. My sister was killed in front of my eyes. A teacher, a teacher of our, of our friend is a teacher killed in front of our eyes, all those things, you know, it was too bad. And Dennis, how about you? When did you make the decision? Well, to be frank, I mean, I did not leave my country. I was about to leave. I wanted to leave. I had the intention to leave. But I didn't have the, the means to leave the country. So I had to be there until the war, I mean, almost was very tense at that time. So my wife and I were about to escape to the other, to the other state, you know, to the other town, I mean, for refuge. And so we are there, I mean, we, 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 I mean, we, we are in an unfinished building, that's where we hid ourselves, and when the ECOMOG troops came and rescued us, I mean, because the rebel had al already arrested us, and they wanted to amputate, uh, uh, amputate us, you know, but God so good that, I mean, the ECOMOG forces just intervened timely for us to be set free. And so I didn't have any. I, I didn't have any time to leave the country to go anywhere. And uh, well, uh, so Ruben, the war drags on for a very long time. Uh, but let's fast forward to 2002, and the the peace accords are signed. What was it like going back? I mean, how had the country changed when you returned? Well, that was in 2003 when. In 2002, we got these uh, uh, filmmakers, these two American and one Canadian, Zach Niles, Banker White, and Chris Valen. They met us entertaining fellow refugees, and they saw that our music is very interesting. And they decided to make a documentary film about us. You know, they took footages and everything. And the other time they came, they, they, they returned back in 2002. And 2003, they came back to continue with the same project. But they decided, they said, we should record. Then I told them that, well, I cannot record in Guinea. I have my, my, my band colleagues that we've been playing together. They know my songs, especially as Shadi Pierce. You know, I said, we should go to Sierra Leone and record. That was in 2003, and the uh, UN, uh, United Nations, really supported these guys. They helped us with uh, a helicopter that brought us to, 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 to Sierra Leone in 2003. That was my first experience being on the sky. <laughs> you know, and we came to, 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 to Freetown in 2003. I saw Freetown like an old, old, old town. And most of the places are like deserted areas, you know, during that time. And most of the important buildings have been, you know, ravaged, you know. Everything is just like, you know. Some places I cannot rec recognize them because they already destroyed the places. But we are so lucky that we found a Shadi Pierce. That was the luck that we had, you know, because we needed him for to go to the studio to record our first album, you know. You know, I felt that really Freetown was really destroyed, you know, many places, yeah. And a total displacement of people. People you know in this street, you will not meet them again. You know, it's like a total displacement of everything, you know. So uh, that was 2002, 2003. So now here over a decade later, uh, we're faced with a new crisis in the form of Ebola. And I think one of the things that contribute to it is just the lack of, of infrastructure and the, the sort of fragile healthcare system. Is that what you found? I mean, uh, the capacity of the country to respond to a crisis like this had been really diminished by the war. Isn't that the case? Yeah, I think so. 
I think it's the case because, you know, people, uh, the country is just trying to recover from the war. Most of the hospitals and the clinics which, you know, have been destroyed by the war, people are trying to repair those things, you know. And then here comes Ebola, you know. And I don't think the country was prepared to handle short situation, you know. So that's the problem. That's that's why it's, it's, it has been very difficult for the country to, you know, get over this Ebola issue, you know. Right. And uh, what what did you find? You two having not left uh, the the reconstruction process after the 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 peace. I mean, did was it? Then what, what you would have expected, or, or were people frustrated at, at the response after the war? Well, people were just trying to recover property, and uh, I mean, mourn over their lost ones and um, trying to get back where they were before, because it's like the war brought setback in, in, in our country. There was no schooling, no education system was going on at that time. So people were really like trying to get back to where they were before. I mean, let's um, talking about moving further. They were just trying to, uh, to, to get back to where they were to move further, you know. Because everything was just like, I mean, I mean very static, you know, at that time. And, and what about a few years prior to, to now, before the Ebola outbreak really hit? I mean, do you think progress was being made in recovery? Yeah. Yes. 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 Progress was made in because they were building roads. Sahelo was dark. Dark, it was dark, dark, no light at all. But, but after that, I think like 50% light was the, in the country. You see, so things was improving. It was improving. Then Ebola comes again. Yeah, yeah so. if I should just buttress his point is that, you know, after the war, actually we experienced a lot of, you know, a uh, lot of development going on, um, especially widening the road. We used to have like, like a two-way, two-way, yeah. Just one Another cab road. coming, one cab going, but most of the roads are now being extended to uh, four-way carriages, which is very good. It's like opening the country, and most of the roads that leads to the provinces, they have been, you know, uh, uh, repaired, and most of the houses and whatnot which were dilapidated, they have been renovated and businesses were coming on and investors we are very much interested in in, in in investing in our country and they create many jobs for the youths like marampa mines uh the iron ore you know they employ a lot of people african mineral you know those who are mining gold they employ many people you know a lot of jobs you know and uh, I don't know, even agriculture was really taking some momentum because we have like Indians, uh, Chinese and Americans helping us out, giving us machines, you know, to develop our agricultural sector. So it's like everybody was trying to push up things, you know. So the Ebola is just like something that came by surprise. Nobody was expecting it, you know. And it has halted all you know, developmental, you know, uh, 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 programs. Well, we're going to take a, a short break. When we come back, we'll talk a little bit about some of those wider impacts beyond just health. So uh, first, we'll we'll take a short break and be back. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. The Institute of World Affairs presents our community with a range of public programs relating to global issues, U.S. foreign policy, and the world economy. For more information about the Institute of World Affairs, call 414-229-3220. 
or visit our website at www.iwa.uwm.edu. Welcome back. If you just joined us, we're talking with members of Sierra Leone's Refugee All-Stars. So we uh, talked a little bit before the break about uh, the years leading up to the current Ebola crisis. And now let's talk a little bit about uh, beyond just the obvious human suffering from people who are impacted by the disease. What are other kinds of wider societal kinds of impacts do you think uh, the, the disease has had? Yeah, well, one of it is our culture. One of our tradition is we, if you have an elderly person, uh, you know, like, like, like a father, when that person die, you know, you have to pay the last respect, which means if you are the eldest son, you have to bury your father. You have to be part of washing its body. It's part of our tradition. But now we cannot do it again. No, if your father dies of Ebola, <laughs> you are not allowed to come very close to him, you know. And the other thing is that, uh, you know, normally Africans, we like to shake hands. It's part of our culture. It shows sign of respect and sign of, like, unity. But we can't shake hands right now. Because when someone has Ebola, you don't have to touch people. If you go to Freetown, my wife was telling me everybody was wearing gloves. Mm -hmm. There is no cool. On hot temperatures, people wear gloves to, to shake hands with, with people. It's really a negative impact, you know. Yeah. And what about uh, the, in the countryside, for example? The, the agriculture is done communally, right? I mean, yeah. uh, we, we all work on your farm one day, yeah. then we move to your farm the yeah. next day. Yeah. Yeah. And has that stopped? It stopped. Mm -hmm. Because stopped. normally we don't have machines, enough machines to do our ag agriculture. So typically what we do is that if I, if I have to brush my farm, I will tell all the other people. And then I set a date, then they will come and assist me, you know. But can't happen right now. Nobody trusted anybody anyway, you know. So it's like a total disconnection of people. And so what does that mean for the, the crops that would have been grown? So uh -huh. going forward, are we going to look forward to, to food insecurity in Sierra Leone as well then? Yeah. Her? Yeah, I think, I think, I think this is I don't know, but I think people are trying to really uh, combat this, this disease. They are working very hard, you know. But and the, uh, other people, especially from the West, like Americans, British, you know, people who have a lot of you know facilities to help us, they are really helping out. So Sierra Leone is not alone in the fight <laughs> against Ebola. You know, we have many people who are helping us and. Uh, they, they try to build more, you know, health facilities so that, uh, you know, when someone has it, they, they will cure that person. Um, apparently, there are many people who survived the Ebola, you know. Yeah, but it's really a difficult thing. Well, and, and you are in a very unique perspective in that you were here watching it from afar, which I'm sure is very, very difficult. but the perception of the threat of Ebola in this country, I think, is, is often disconnected with the reality. So I'm thinking there was a, a Gallup poll recently where Americans were asked what was the biggest danger facing American society was, and the respondents placed Ebola above violent crime and homelessness and, and a host of other things. So what has been your experience just among uh, the, the people around you when they hear you're from Sierra Leone? Well, that's kind of uh, like discrimination, you know. Like people don't like to even come closer to us when we come from Africa because they think as long as you are from Africa, you must have been infected by the Ebola disease. So they don't have confidence 
in coming closer to us any, any more like before, you know. And uh, some do come closer to us because they know us. Do, those who know us come closer to us. Some of them who, who do not know us always think that maybe we may have contracted the disease. I mean, so uh, one of the things that actually is happening in my country um, is that um, most places where like musicians used to go and, and look for their daily bread or playing in clubs for them to get money, those places were closed. So they no longer have anywhere to faint for their daily bread. So that, that is one of the negative impact that the Ebola crisis, I mean disease, made in our country. Talk about the restaurant. Oh, <laughs> one time I went to a restaurant to buy food, a Liberian restaurant. So this lady, she knows, she knows that we are Sierra Leone refugee stars and we are Sierra Leonean. So. I went to, to the woman to, to shock her with the woman. The woman just making like this. She's just speaking like this. I said, what is happening? So, okay. They came, they served us food. After eating the food, the other lady came to take the money. Then she went back and put on his glove, her glove, and came and took the money. So the next day, we went there again to, to, to get food. So the woman, the woman confessed to, to us. She said, you see, why I did not shake your hand yesterday? I thought that you are just from Sierra Leone. You came with Ebola, so that I'm afraid to shake your hand, yeah. not knowing that you are here for long. And, <laughs> and this is a woman from Liberia. Yes. From Liberia. <laughs> yeah. yeah. See? 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 Well, so, uh, so you were in this country for a tour of some six months or so, yeah. right? When, yeah. And your tour ended just yeah. about yeah. the time when the, the crisis really hit. So tell us what you've been doing since. I mean, how, first of all, how did you make that, that, I'm sure, very difficult decision to stay away from your families and stay away from your country? Well, you know, we just uh, think that uh, it's dangerous for us to go. And the group has suffered a lot. We have lost four members along the way. It's not through Ebola. To be sincere, it's not through Ebola. But we just don't want to lose any other member because <laughs> if we do, then the group is finished. So that's the main reason why we just make that decision. It's a very difficult decision to make because, you know, Right now, we are, uh, right now, we are far away from our children, our, our, our wives, you know, it's a difficult situation, but, uh, you know, if we are all there, nothing is happening. We, we are musicians, and we get our money through playing music. In a situation where all businesses are closed, we cannot find a living there. You see, so that's why we decided to stay here because here we we can have gigs to play and have money to keep you know to feed our family back home. Well, you know? in addition to uh, to the money that you're able to send personally back home, you're helping raise money for uh, for relief efforts at home. Talk a little bit about that. Yeah, we uh, in our, our last concert we we are able to raise money and support uh, a TV station that is operating in Sierra Leone so that they can um, um, disseminate the information uh, on how to, to prevent yourself uh, from this Ebola. You know, I think that will help educate people about the Ebola and how to prevent yourself from it. You know, that's why we gave, it's, it's really not a big money, but it's a thousand dollar, dollars that we, we sent. And the people appreciated it a lot, you know, and they, they were very happy for that. So now we are trying to raise money to do more, to help even Ebola survivors, you know, because really it has killed many people. And you have a lot of children who are, 
who, are, who don't have, ah, I don't know how to call them, they don't have parents because of the Ebola. And we're just thinking that caring for them could be pardoning. So uh, we've got just about a minute left. So if our viewers are interested in being part of that effort, what uh, would you suggest they do? Well, for Milwaukee, you just come and buy a T-shirt. <laughs> <laughs> That's one. Or buy a CD from, from our CD sales. Uh, is there a website they can go to and take a look? Yes, they can go to the website. They Which can is go on, what? How would they find that? Uh, yes, well, it's uh, www. Sierra Leone's Refugee All Stars dot org. And that's an org, not a com. That's important. So, yeah. Uh, very good. Well, uh, wish you well. I certainly wish your families well back home, and hopefully it'll all be resolved very soon and you'll be united. And yeah. in the meantime, wish you great success in your tour here. To our viewers, we'll see you next time. And I think we've got some of your music to play us out. So, uh, we'll see you soon. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you very much. For information about the Institute of World Affairs and its many programs, or to become a member of the Institute, call 414-229-3220, or visit us at our website.